DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of Conversations with Dr. Lillis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual masterwork, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you once again for joining me. It's wonderful to be with you, Chris, and really what an opportunity to talk about some very beautiful things that St. Teresa of Avila is sharing with us. Kind of a fascinating time in the history of the church. Yeah, it, it really is. Once again, to center ourselves about where Teresa is writing all of this, the year is it's in the 1500s. It is a time in Europe where there has been tumultuous changes. The church seems to have splintered in half or more different pieces. And there's wars going on. There's illnesses going on. There's all kinds of situations happening, isn't there? Yes, you have on one hand, one of the most aggressive outreaches for the gospel of Christ in the history of mankind, We the kingdom of Spain and Portugal will basically evangelize the Americas during this time frame. We're in the 1560s and 70s to kind of give you uh, the time frame in which she's writing and when these ideas are developing. Our Lady Guadalupe has appeared in America and it's been a sign of hope. By this time in the 16th century, the descriptions, historical descriptions are that there are tens of thousands of baptisms every day. Uh, So many baptisms, the missionaries can't keep up with them uh, all throughout Mexico and beyond. Our Lady Guadalupe had that effect. At the same time, this is also the the time of the Council of Trent. And so uh, all the efforts at reform and, uh, and conversations about spiritual renewal have taken place in really bitter and difficult fights have happened among different churchmen and among different religious communities. This is the time of the Inquisition in Spain, where um, the Inquisition was trying to protect people against aberrant forms of spirituality and also uh, against the rise of an expression of faith that was hostile or mistrusting and suspicious of the church. So this is going on, and it had all kinds of bad doctrine in it. And the Inquisition tried to to dampen that down and was meeting more or less success. And they're looking at people like Teresa of Avila, who seem to be talking about an experience of the faith that sounds like what the Reformers are talking about, but also sounds Catholic. And so they're trying to discern, is Teresa of Avila, a good guy or a bad guy? Is she, is she going to support and build up the church or is she tearing it apart? Because the division that Protestantism has caused in Northern Europe and the wars that have gone out, they, they don't want that to happen in Spain. And then at the same time, the kingdom of, of Spain has been involved in military campaigns uh, that are huge for Christendom. Islam has risen up, is threatening the West, and the kingdom of Spain is uh, kind of the leader in trying to put a check to their naval advancements in the Mediterranean. And then at the same time that that's going on, Protestant revolts in the northern part of Europe. These aren't just, you know, people saying things, but, but they're very violent and they involve a disruption to the whole social order. And the again, the kingdom of Spain is trying to uh, provide social order, you know, establish peace in uh, Northern Europe. This is also the time we have England and the Spanish Armada and, and that military disaster. All those things are things that are going on while Teresa of Avila is writing, uh, doing her spiritual writings. 
and this particular work that we're we're looking at right now her early writings the writings she did soon after her conversion were put on the index by the inquisitors and so she's been asked to write yet another book to encourage uh, those who are in her reform movement to encourage them in mental prayer this is kind of the fruit of a lifetime of uh, prayer and wisdom gained and, and at the same time she's proposing it she's putting it forward even as she's under investigation she herself said that and i never really appreciated it that she thanked god that she died a catholic and i i heard that saw that line saw saw where she wrote that i thought well what a curious thing to say you know she she's a saint she couldn't have done anything that would ruffle feathers like that and but she did and it wasn't a sure thing. And, and there was a lot of ambiguity and tension and conflict from outside the church, but also right in the church. And in particular, there is concern about mental prayer, the practice of contemplative prayer, and whether or not this is something that should be promoted. She has led a reform of the Carmelite uh, religious life, and especially the cloistered uh, contemplative nuns, she's led a reform to try to reorder their life so that as much of their life can be baptized in mental prayer as can possibly be the case. She's reconstructed their way of life, helped them return to their roots, because in their roots is this practice of mental prayer. In this book, what she's trying to talk about uh, overall is why is mental prayer good for the church? Why is helping people mature in their prayer life important? Why is it a good thing to go beyond simply saying our vocal prayers to enter into a deeper kind of union with God? And in this chapter, she's talking about this kind of prayer, the experiences of prayer as a soul is betrothed. And she described this betrothal uh, at the end of, of her last book, Five, where, where Jesus kind of makes a promise of himself to the soul. And when the soul says yes to that, Jesus begins to wake that soul up to a deeper kind of union with him. This book six of the interior castle is all about different ways that Jesus wakes up the soul. And this third chapter uh, one of the ways Jesus uses to wake up the soul is through an experience called locutions. It's one of the most intriguing chapters, I think, in the book. It's, I mean, the whole book is, I mean, how do you pick a chapter that you like? Because really, it's like making a Sophie's choice. Every Every single chapter is a gem. But this one in particular is kind of intriguing in that I'm sure there are people out there that have heard maybe someone come up to him and said, the Lord has told me to tell you this. Or there is somebody who says, I've heard the Lord. And for someone who's not real versed in what that might mean, it's, it's, a, curious, it's a curious experience. Some of it may be from God and maybe not. And Teresa tries to clear that up here, doesn't she? Yes. And what a locution is, is you hear a voice and you could hear the voice exterior to yourself through your ears, or you can hear the voice in your imagination, or you can hear the voice in your intellect. So with from without, she'll use the term from without, and she's talking about something that you hear with your ears, or she'll talk about within, and normally she's talking about the imagination, or as she'll sometimes say, from above. And she means something that happens in the intellect itself. And God can use exterior, interior, or locutions, or a locution from above to communicate to the soul, and he does. And this is her normal experience. But she also is experienced enough to know that sometimes what can happen in your imagination, or what can seem to be from above, or even what can happen, what you think you're hearing on the outside. This can be something that comes from your own melancholy, you self-generate it, or it can be from the evil one. It's not necessarily from the Lord himself. And so in this chapter, she lays down some principles, which actually John of the Cross will develop in Ascent to Mount Carmel book two. In fact, when I'm reading this chapter, chapter, 
I keep on thinking about John of the Cross and I thought, wow, they must have had some powerful conversations with each other about this. She's kind of trying to give us some guidelines for the discernment. The one other thing I'd like to distinguish, I'd like to distinguish these locutions from what you would call in the charismatic renewal, something, a gift freely given. Sometimes the Lord can move somebody with a, a prophetic utterance to to say, you know, this is what the Lord is saying. And some people, the way they exercise that gift, they will come out and they'll say, the, the Lord is saying X, Y, and Z. And other people, I believe, use that prophetic gift in a much more subtle way. But that gift is a little different than what Teresa of Avila is talking about. What Teresa of Avila is talking about is is a gift that wakes up the soul that the Lord has betrothed to himself. Whereas the other gift, the gift that uh, charismatics sometimes refer to, but other people do as well, that's a gift for the building up of the body. Let me give you an example of a gift for the building up of the body, a, a prophetic gift. When John Paul II was elected, he gave voice to this utterance. The message that he gave voice to was, be not afraid to open wide the doors to Christ. That message, be not afraid, defined a whole era of the church from the late 70s well into the 2000s, where, where uh, his messages over and over and over again resonated with be not afraid. Do not be afraid to open wide the, the doors to Christ, that Christ has this wonderful, powerful plan in our lives. And we need to trust him and we need to be bold and we need to be creative and we can't be afraid of who we are or what we have to say. God is doing something. God is in control. He is the Lord of history. We are not the victims of circumstance or being pushed around by the exigencies of the moment or the schemes of the powerful. God has taken our side and God is doing something beautiful and we need to believe in it. That was the pro prophecy of John Paul II. He didn't have to say, the Lord told me to say to you. He has, the Pope, gave voice in this prophetic way to that word, and that word resonated in generations of Catholics who were formed with a deep sense of hope. That kind of prophetic utterance has a power that edifies and builds up the whole body of Christ. And there are people who have that gift, uh, and when they use the gift for the building up of the body of Christ, it usually provides courage and confidence, boldness and creativity to do things they wouldn't otherwise do especially when times are needed. I believe that today, under the circumstances that we're in right now with this pandemic, that there will be prophetic voices that speak out to us. I think Pope Francis, when he gave the blessing, invited the whole church to pray for the end of the coronavirus. I believe he had a prophetic gift in some of the things that he was saying. And so you discern the prophetic gifts and you ask yourself, how is this building up my life, you know, and how do I respond to it? That's a gift for the building up of the of the body of Christ. This other gift, this other locution is a gift that leads someone, wakes them up to a deeper kind of union with Christ Jesus. And sometimes Christ Jesus directs them to do projects uh, in the church, take up great activities. Teresa of Avila, of course, started the reform of the Carmelite order. She came back and she reformed. In addition to starting a reform, she also brought renewal to the community that she had been with, the Ocarm. She is also seen not only as a foundress of a new religious community, but as a reformer of the original community that she came from. And she did that, I believe, if you read this chapter carefully, you're dealing with a soul who's very, very accustomed to interlocutions. And those interlocutions called her into taking up very specific projects. So she had to discern, is this really from God? Is God asking me to do this? Or am I imagining it? And because she suffered that, that's why we have so much good wisdom in this chapter. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? 
Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. Litany of Humility O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, that others may be esteemed more than I, that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. Yeah, she does bring up that it can come from, as you just said, three places, from God, the devil, or the imagination. And it it can be difficult sometimes because God works with our imagination, doesn't he? That's right. And so God can work through our imagination. And so there are locutions that happen in our imagination that are from God himself. But the imagination is such an interesting power. It can also self-generate. So how do you know if God speaks in your imagination? How do you know that's really the Lord? And how do you, or something that you've self-generated? But you can do the same thing with your external senses. Your external senses can imagine that they've heard something. 
and it's you're just overreacting to uh, to a, a situation you know if anybody's watched a scary movie you know every time there's a little clink in one of your pipes you, you're all of a sudden frightened well before you saw the scary movie that all your house was making all kinds of noises all the time and they didn't bother you but now they all bother you you know well your imagination has been excited by something and so and so you hear things in a way that you didn't hear them before. You imagine senses, your external senses, and the power of your imagination. All of a sudden, it takes on an energy that's not that's not true. It's kind of you're living in in a kind of la la land, and that's very dangerous. Yeah, don't get me going on the experience of childhood watching The Twilight Zone. Don't, don't. <laughs> oh my gosh, bad for childhood. Bad for childhood. But in hearing that, but you know, I, and I don't want to take us down too far of a rabbit hole on this, but as you were talking, it kind of reminds me of, it's important to have this caution when you enter into the spiritual practices, one in particular of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and I'm thinking of primarily the colloquy, Ignatius would have you sit and have a conversation with, in a, place, in a chair that's in front of you, and maybe that's Jesus sitting there with you. And you pray with him, and you begin to enter that friendship, that conversation. And not, I'm not saying it's necessarily the same thing, but that's where the steps she took to discern what you can say reasonably is actually when you enter into that dialogue, that is the Lord, or it's maybe not because it has these hallmarks. Am I stepping too far afield here, Anthony? No, and so the, the hallmarks she gives are, are kind of – classical ones and and then there's different kinds of advice too and so that the first thing that you need to discern that she brings up to our thing is you know are you dealing with somebody uh, if they are hearing claim they're hearing locutions and they're absolutely um uh, certain about it pastorally what do you do with them how do you deal with these souls and in every case this is true of everyone who hears locutions and they're excited about them the first thing you do is you calm them down Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> and and you don't argue with them about whether or not they've actually ho heard a locution or not. You just calm them down and and you know thank them what a beautiful gift you've received and what a blessing for you to receive this. Let's pray about what it is. And so you don't want to get into a fight with a person now. And what you're doing when you're first calming them down, one of the things you're going, am I dealing with somebody who has a very excitable temperament or a mulling? melancholy temperament and is it likely that in their psychological weakness that they're self-generating this thing if they are self-generating this thing one of the things one of the things that you'd want to do with that kind of soul as you discern that is you you would want them to spend a little bit less time in prayer than they have up till now they're having a conversation with themselves and it's become this monologue that they think is a dialogue and they need to get out and be engaged in reality and doing works of mercy, uh, both spiritual and corporal works of mercy. They need to get back in touch with their body and back in touch with their senses because this self-generated stuff is is not good for the soul. And that's not what prayer, prayer isn't about self-generated or self-manufactured states of consciousness. One of the problems I have with certain kinds of techniques, like even centering prayer, for example, or, or Catholic mindfulness, is without saying that they're striving for it, there's a striving for a certain kind of state of consciousness. And when you're striving for a state of consciousness, you are vulnerable to psychological breakdown. And that's where this person is headed. So you want to get them out of spending so much time in prayer because they're not really praying. They think they are, but they're not. They're indulging in overactive imagination. You got to get them doing practical stuff. This advice is very similar to advice that we saw already in the first chapter of, um, of this book. In the first chapter of this book, she, she said there will be times when souls who are at this stage of the spiritual life are having a hard time remaining in silence. They're antsy and they're disturbed. And when that's the case, when they don't have the devotion that they need to be able to be in prayer, then have them do spiritual and corporal works of mercy. So she already gave that to us in chapter one. Here in chapter three, she's coming back to it, but in particular for these souls that are self-generating locutions 
what they think are locutions. And it's really an overactive imagination. And so that's the first thing. Then there are people, even those who are psychologically healthy, can sometimes self-generate the stuff. Sometimes it's the evil one and sometimes it's God. So she asks, how do you know when it's God as opposed to the evil one or self-generated things for people? Now she's talking about people are healthy. And still, even here, she's her counsel that she's laid out is basically the same. You want to calm these people down and you don't want them to be too occupied with the locution itself. And the reason she gives is one that John of the Cross underlines and puts in capitals. Well, he doesn't actually underline it, put it in capitals, but he repeats over and over and over again in Ascent to Mount Carmel, book two. And that is, if this locution is from the Lord, the moment it is spoken, it's already produced its good fruit. So you don't have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to try to remember it. Somebody has recently asked me the question, you know, I'm in prayer and the Lord starts speaking me, to me in prayer. And so I feel like I need to write it down. But when I write it down, it's almost like I lost what he was giving to me. So what should I do when the Lord speaks to me? And I said, I answered the person back. I said, when the Lord speaks to you, you don't interrupt him to write things down. You let him say what he's got to say to you. You let him speak. And if you're supposed to remember anything that he's he's said to you, he'll give you the power to remember it because he's that good. You don't need to worry about how you're going to remember what he says. You need to simply receive what he has to say. It's just like a conversation with, with your spouse. If your spouse starts talking and you say, stop, uh, stop a second, honey, I need to write this down. You're paying more attention to writing things down than you're paying attention to me. Well, the Lord wants the attention of our hearts. When he has the attention to our hearts, he's able to put things in them that are, are uh, quite beautiful. We're anxious when he speaks to us. That anxiety, that disturbance, the disturbance that we're bringing into our conversation with him will impede him from being able to communicate what he wants. And, and normally, a, a locution from the Lord has certain characteristics. Normally, it's uh, what's spoken is not long and involved, but even when it is, it's extremely clear and precise and astonishing. It's not what you would expect it to be. And the other thing is, when it is from the Lord, even when it's a longer message, uh, but normally he gives short messages, when it's from the Lord, you never have any problem remembering it. In fact, people tell you, don't pay attention to it, ignore it, it will go away. And they'll tell you all this, lots of people will tell you this over many, many years. And years later, you'll still remember it word for word. It goes right into the very depths of who you are. And that word is kind of irrevocably attached to your spirit. Whereas when it's your imagination and you're self-generating the thing, you'll notice that uh, there's a lack of clarity. There's a lack of originality. The voice seems to be saying exactly what you want God to be saying to you at the time. If you have a scrupulous conscience, he, it's saying condemning things. And if you have an indulgent conscience, it's saying things that excuse your sin. It conforms with what you want it to say, when you want to say it, and how you want it to say it. You can't remember it very clearly afterwards. And even the phraseology that's used isn't very clear. There's something confused in it. That's normally a sign that it's come from you. And the other thing is you forget it over a period of time. And it doesn't produce the peace. It doesn't have the power that a word from the Lord will have in your life. When the Lord speaks, there's like power. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, you and an authority. And all of a sudden, something that you couldn't do before, you find the freedom and the confidence and the boldness to do it. Whereas when it's from yourself, none of that comes. When it's the word of the Lord, there's a deep peace and certitude your soul rests in. When it's self-generated or from the evil one, the evil one can't produce that peace and neither can your own spirit. So these are some of the things, the signs she gives to help people realize. And for those who are working with those who are having the locutions. First off, at this stage of the spiritual life, locutions are kind of a normal phenomena. They're not 
extraordinary, but they can come from the evil one, they can come from one's imagination, or they can come from the Lord. And likely, the soul that is experiencing them will experience all of that, <laughs> you know, you know uh, because Teresa of Avila did. And so you want to calm them down. You want to get them to not pay so much attention to them because if they're from the Lord, they're going to have their own power and they won't be able to forget them anyway. And then you want to look for the fruits. And what are the fruits? Is the soul more at peace? Is the soul more confident and bold in uh, its projects to serve the Lord? Is it obedient to the church? Does it have an underlying sense of obedience and humility and docility? When you see those things, the Lord has spoken to it. A soul that the Lord has spoken to is at once wants to do something so great because they want to respond to the immensity with which they're loved. And at the same time, they want to do something great for the Lord. At the same time, they're profoundly aware of their own sinfulness and they're profoundly aware that they do deserve nothing other than to go to hell except for the love of God. And the love of God has so overwhelmed them, they just need to respond to, to that love. It's They're not self-occupied. They're completely focused on the Lord. We'll continue our conversation on this particular chapter of St. Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle in our next episode. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There, too, you will find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.